Who initiates an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Who initiates an awakening? And everybody says, well, it's God, isn't it? It's obviously God's timing. But I would like to input to that and say, well, yes, he puts it on our hearts to seek him and to plead with him and to repent from our sins and to turn from our wicked ways and to seek his face. And we respond and then he does too. So who said these words? It is not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses. Who said that? Jesus. Yes, that's the right answer in church, isn't it? It's always Jesus. Amen. What about this one? It was here when I uh, last read it. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down and the mountains might tremble before you as, fire, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and wa causes water to boil. Come down and make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. Isaiah. Yes, that's right. It's chapter 64, verse 1. It's a fantastic scripture. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Both of those scriptures are, conf are shared with you out of context, I have to say, because the first one was about the, <clears throat> the coming, the physical kingdom of uh, Israel being reestablished at the time of uh, Jesus' ascension. But I've used it to embody my thoughts and feelings about this subject which I've been given which is called revival because um, though we may feel it's going to happen we don't know when and it does seem to be up to God to decide when it happens and those of us who can see the need for it to happen would say oh that you would rend the heavens and come down it's a fantastic word isn't it some of the other um, Bible versions say open up the heavens and come down but no, rend the heavens and come down because in Isaiah's time surrounded by enemies and the um, imminence of oppression and so on the, to get God to come down and do something about it was really on his heart and that's really what um, um, I have to share with you today now John Wesley used to say that um, when he preached, he told the people what he was going to say, then he said it, and then he reminded them what he'd said. So my next slide, I think, is a summary of what I'd like to take us through. Now, if we'd been on the 40-day fast, we would have read Mark's Gospel. And obviously, um, if you want to know what happens after the resurrection, you go to Acts of the Apostles. So I've just done a quick summary of the um, scriptures, the references in these two books of the Bible which focus on the kind of things which we can expect to happen when this rending of the heavens and the coming down takes place. Now, before I get into that, um, if I'm going to talk about revival, uh, it would be addressed by as many different ways as different people do it. So this is my way of sharing with you how I've been Im impacted by this concept of being revived. Um, and uh, so that's it. I hope you go home blessed. So going through Mark's Gospel, this is my quick survey. Chapter 1, verse 28. News about Jesus spread quickly over the whole region. 133, the whole town came together at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases and who drove out many demons. Chapter 145, the people came to him from everywhere. Chapter 212, Jesus amazed everyone and they praised God. We have never seen anything like this. Chapter 213, a large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. A large crowd came to him. Chapter 3, 7, a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard of all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea and elsewhere. He got into a boat because of the crowd. He healed many, and many were pushing towards him. Chapter 3, 20, again, such a crowd formed that he and his disciples were not able to eat. How sad. Good for the figure. Chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus began to teach by the lake. 
The gathering crowd was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it, and the people were lined up along the shore. Chapter 5.21, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. 5.24, a large crowd followed him and pressed around him. Get the impression of the largeness of the impact of the ministry of the Lord Jesus in revival time. Chapter 6, verse 2, he began to teach and many who heard him were amazed, teaching from village to village. 6.31, because so many people were coming and going, they didn't have a chance to eat. 6.34, Jesus saw a large crowd, about 5,000 men, plus their lady friends, 10,000, plus their kids, 20,000. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. 6.55, they ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to where the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was, countryside and marketplaces. 10 verse 1, Jesus crossed the Jordan and again crowds of people came to him and he taught them. 10.46, together with a large crowd he was leaving Jericho. 11.8, many people threw their cloaks on the road as Jesus entered Jerusalem on the donkey. After that, the crowds that were associated with the life of Jesus were those shouting for his crucifixion or being um, overcome by those who were shouting for his crucifixion. And then we move to Acts of the Apostles and we read the same kind of growth phenomenon. Chapter 241, about 3,000 new people were added to the number of believers on that day. 2.47, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Chapter 4, verse 4, many who heard the message believed, and the number of men, let alone the other ones, grew to about 5,000. Imagine coping with that. 4.31, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. 4.33, With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. 5.14, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. 5.16, crowds gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. 5.42, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. 6 verse 1. In those days, the numbers of disciples were increasing. Get the picture. It's big. It's growing. It's wonderful. 6, 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of the priests became obedient to the faith. Even the religious leaders. Good, isn't it? Chapter 8, verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. 9.31, the church enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. 9.42, Dorcas's healing became known all over Joppa and many believed on the Lord. 11.20, those scattered by the persecution after Stephen began telling the non-Jews the good news about Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. 11.24, after Barnabas' encouragement, a great number of people were brought to the Lord. The word of the Lord continued to increase and spread. 13.44, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. I hope you're enjoying this. 1349, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. 14 verse 1, they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. 1421, the preaching of the good news won a large number of disciples. 16 verse 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. We're not talking about a spread over years here. We're talking about a mighty work of God in a relatively short time, but something which we're looking forward to. 17.4 in Thessalonica, some Jews joined and a large number of God-fearing Gentiles and not a few prominent women. 17.12 in Berea, many of the Jews believed, as did also a great number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. 18.8 in Corinth, many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. 
19.10. All who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. That's after the revival in Ephesus. 19.20. The word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. And finally, 21.20. You see how many thousands of Jews have believed. So that's a summary of, of, of what happens in the New Testament when the Holy Spirit comes and uh, makes a big difference. Now, in this little book called The Revivals in the Bible, we could turn to many in the Old Testament where the, the work of the Lord impacted the environment, the community. Revival in the times of the judges, under Samuel, under King Asa, under Elijah, under Jonah, remember him? Nineveh? Under King Hezekiah, under King Josiah, over Zerubbabel, over Haggai and Zechariah, over Ezra, over Nehemiah, and then he mentions under John the Baptist, the Pentecost, Samaria, Caesarea, Antioch, and it ends up with revival going into Europe. Now, that's one book which isn't on that book table because I've got it here, but I'd encourage you to have a look at what's over there because as you read about what's happened in the past, it anoints you and inspires you that it can happen in our day, as we shall be seeing later on, I trust. Okay, so um, every book I've read about re revivals has to go through a process of defining what revival is because most authors don't think we know and therefore they have to explain to us what they think revival is. So I've selected a few um, aspects of what we think um, are, is, is a revival and uh, want to show you what they mean. So the first one is outpouring. Have you heard of the word outpouring? where God, in his abundance, pours out water of refreshing until it spills over and goes everywhere and doesn't stop. And it's lovely to participate in. <laughs> but unlike the jug, his blessing is immeasurable. It never stops. It only stops perhaps when we get fed up with it or whatever. We'll look at that in a minute. But he's so generous and his jug never runs out. And our glasses can be full, and we can sort of share it, you know, sort of, if you want to. Ah, oh, wonderful. <laughs> now, another word that's used in the history is awakening, for which I have a, an assistant. <laughs> now, you think that may sound horrible. You can have a go in there in a minute if you want to. But... Awakening. The church needs to be awakened, don't we? To the joys and the experience of what God wants to do. Now, if you didn't think that sounded very good, how about this? Oh. <laughs> One blast for turning right. Two blasts for turning left. Three blasts for going straight forward. And four blasts for going behind. Thank you, my father, from this in his boat. And that's a bit loud. But um, if you want something a little more gentle, and um, is my favourite, this one comes from Canada, and uh, is um, what the old steam trains used to sound like in the old days. Listen to this. Isn't that lovely? I think that's good. Um, I might do that again because it's so nice, isn't it? <laughs> anyway. Now, the usual word we use is revival. <laughs> there's, there's aspects about this which might remind you of the church, as with the other two examples. Don't tell my wife that I stole it from the garden. But this one is what it should look like when God's put his hand on it, full of blossom and fruit and filling up the space provided. Revival needs to be revived. So that's a word that we're used to. Now, another word we use is renewal. Now, I want you to wave up your Bible, Sonia. Wave it up. 
There we are. That is a Bible renewed because it came to me with its back broken, the cover falling off. I checked the words are still okay and uh, I put a new cover on it. So um, we're not wishing to sound too big-headed. When the master gets at the thing that re needs renewing and he puts his hand on it, it comes out new and it comes with a 10-year guarantee. So that's good. <laughs> <isn't it? coughs> Now, the example I have to choose for the next word, restoration, is, um, has a story behind it. Next one. Long ago, when I was 50 years younger, um, our church needed transport for our burgeoning Sunday school. So for 100 pounds, I went and bought a new bus. Could you like to put that picture up? And on the left, if you can see it, there's a picture of a, a coach which was 14 years old when it was converted from a double-decker to a coach. It has a wonderful history, which I've outlined in my book called Remember Me, because I was the driver of it. And in the um, realm of that old vehicle, we travelled thousands of miles taking people to meetings and bringing Sunday school from the estate where Joyce lived, that's where I started chatting them up, isn't it? Um, to school. But after um, six years with us, um, we didn't need it anymore. And so I sold it to somebody who's restored it. On the right-hand side there, you can see it restored to its original as-delivered condition in terms of its colours. They rebuilt the engine, they did the brakes and everything else, and it's a great story. Um, but it's been restored. And there's an aspect about church that uh, is, is shown there, that after a lot of use and being worn out and being rebuilt and making it look nice a bit, then it goes into the hands of the master and it's presented back to us in a restored and wonderful condition. And uh, finally, Reformation. Um, what else can we say about Reformation than Mr. Reformation Man hanging up on his church door things about that need to be done. Now, the Reformation that Martin Luther instituted was to bring the church back to the Bible. He discovered that you're saved by faith, not by works or indulgences, but going back to the principles of the Word of God. And that's the best picture I could find of him. Um, and, and I'm thinking about when, in this context, Reformation, bringing us back to the Bible. Now, in the Directions magazine a few months ago, it said of the Christians that they've interviewed, only 20% of them read their Bibles. So if we're going to go back to Reformation, and the principles of it, let's decide to get back into our Bibles, which is what we're supposed to be into, isn't it? When you get to heaven and Nahum says, did you read my book? And you says, what book? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Have mercy on him. And then I think um, as we're seeking to do in the second best house group is to establish the, the principles of the, um, the apostles' teaching, and I've looked up in the Bible, the apostles are um, those ones that I haven't put up there, including Jude, the teaching in the New Testament for us to um, enjoy. Um, in the Acts of the Apostles, they, they, they did the teaching of the apostles that are, were around. Um, the breaking of bread, the fellowship, and the prayers. And we're seeking to do that in our Connect group. But in the terms of Reformation, getting back to basics, that's what um, God is looking for. And I notice also that they met in the colonnade around the temple. And a book that somebody lent me saying the, the temple courts could accommodate over 200,000 people. So in the new church, we just read five or 6,000, 3,000 and so on. They had no problem meeting there and, um, and fellowshipping, but they also met in houses. So there's a principle, house groups where the life and the relationships can be developed, and in the large gathering, making a statement to the great outdoors that something's going on and people getting drawn into it. So that's my declaration. That's what we should be getting into. Um, so the summary, then, of, of definitions as revival 
is that it's a work of God in his church that impacts society. It's a work of God in his church which impacts society eventually, but not too long. Now, Martin Lloyd-Jones, I was thinking about him. People of my generation know who he is, but others probably don't. Martin, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was the pastor of Westminster Chapel for many years and was respected as a, a worthy teacher. And the things he said seem to go down well with most Christians, I think. And his definition of revival or outpouring or awakening or new renewal or restoration or reformation is a return to Pentecost. That's a very good summary, I suggest, of um, what it's all about. So now I want to just um, move on then, if I may. Now we've defined what we're talking about. Over there, there's my library of books about revival. And I have to confess, I've read them all, but I can't remember much, well, everything about it. And I certainly can't remember where I read it. But it's all there. So if I quote something, it's in there somewhere. You'll have to find it. <laughs> but... Um, so there's, there's all this information. I can understand that if you've been in a revival and experienced it, and, and you know that out there there's people who would like to know about it, you write about it, definitely, because it does communicate. My experience, as, as I've read these books, most of them, some of them a bit academic and a bit... But most of them inspires one to think, yes, it could happen to me, it could happen here, it could happen in this city, it could happen in our nation, and it could happen in the world. Because, as I shall share later on, I think God really loves doing it. Now, so I'm just going to run through a few things that I've picked up. One book says that being keen on revival has to be caught. <coughs> Excuse me. Has to be caught. One of the first challenges to someone who's got the fire for revival is to convince their church that it's a good thing. And I found that, I've shared with some people, no, I don't need revival. What's the point? Um, God's going to make things worse before things are going to get better. You know, you get sort of this sort of feedback which doesn't encourage one. But one still has the fire of God in you and you want to share it. But the first challenge is to convince other people that it's actually a good thing that God wants it to happen. Um, some of the res responses are, well, it... The, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was restricted to the early church to get them going, and it certainly did. And I know people in this city who will say that. It was for then, it's not for now. The Holy Spirit doesn't work like that anymore. I'm not sure how they cope with the evidence that he is working. Some of them are very extreme, saying, well, it's obviously not from God, it must be from the other side. But clearly it isn't. I remember going into an office with a chap from another denomination didn't believe in speaking in tongues, but he and I had a good relationship in the Christian fellowship and we prayed together and we did everything together. And this subject came up about, no, I think he'd, he'd, taught in, he'd been taught in his church that speaking in tongues was of the devil and stuff, you see, that Sunday. So the subject came up. So I said, well, if I speak in tongues, he said, okay, well, okay, must be all right then, because I was okay. And I'd use the gift, and so it was for the early church. The other, <laughs> the other response was that we have the Holy Spirit. I, I can see the point, because I read in the Bible, that I and you are filled with all the fullness of God. How much fuller can you be? So it must be okay. Well, it ain't okay, is it? I mean, I, I miss opportunities, which I shouldn't do if I was really being filled with the Holy Spirit. I get angry sometimes, which I shouldn't do if I'm really filled with the Holy Spirit. I get despondent sometimes, which I shouldn't do if I'm really filled with the Holy Spirit. If I'm filled with all the fullness of God, for crying out loud, I ought to be bursting because he's so much bigger than me, isn't he? So much bigger than you. So cheer up, folks. Um, <laughs> we're filled with all the fullness of God, but there's more. It's no good saying, well, since we're filled with all the fullness of God, we can't expect anything more wonderful, spectacular, whatever it is. And I've also discovered, as I've said before, and I might say again, that as one looks and reads at what happened in the past and why it happened and the circumstances in the society 
when it happened or before it happened, one is encouraged to believe it's needed and God wants to do it again. And we wonder what's holding him up. Well, I can tell you that in a minute. The other thing that comes out of the reading of this book is who initiates a revival? Who initiates an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Who initiates an awakening? And Everybody says, well, it's God, isn't it? It's obviously God's timing. But I would like to input to that and say, well, yes, he puts it on our hearts to seek him and to plead with him and to repent from our sins and to turn from our wicked ways and to seek his face. And we respond and then he does too. But where does this yearning come from that he might manifest his glory, he might change this nation? I heard on the radio only yesterday in the context of the, the challenges that we're facing, the, the country is so split, this country is so upset, the country is so not knowing where it's going. How are we going to be healed? How are we going to be brought back together? Do you know the answer? Jesus. Don't keep it to yourself. Uh, it's not being spoken of yet. It's all about economics. It's all about politics. And strangely enough, the church is a bit quiet. But anyway, look at that in a minute. We need to awaken, this is from the library, we need to awaken the church from the five C's. Complacency. Don't really mind if it happens or not. Compromise. What does the church stand for these days? We allow everything just to be popular. Not this church, but the church. Criticism. <laughs> we wouldn't do it that way. So disunity. Cynicism. No, it didn't work before, it won't work this time. <laughs> Commercialism. I pray for three months, I expect something to happen. I haven't had anything, nothing's happened, so I'll give up. Or can I pour my money into it and see it happen? The five C's the church needs to be delivered from, so says one of the books. And then there's a danger of the studying of revival being an end in itself. But no, the idea is, to, is not to be entertained by these books and these histories, but to be moved by them to say, Lord, let it happen in me. Let it happen in us. Let it happen in the, in the nation. It's a means to an end. And by studying it or reading about it, it's faith building. And of course, in the history, in the books, prayer groups, personal preparation is, is always key. Not, not in the sense of focusing on revival, because in there, there's a very interesting book about revivals in Scotland, where when the Lord turned up, in one or two churches, he, almost, he also turned up in many more. Some of them weren't seeking. He just decided to bless them. Um, and so it's, it's prayer does seem to be, everyone will tell you, that personal preparation and prayer groups, which... Um, and I've been thinking, now we're praying tonight in the creche. Um, we've been doing that about seven years, I think. It's a long time. And that's sort of the kind of time scale that I read about in these books before God breaks out. So I'm looking forward to tonight to make it seven years and another week. Now in this process of prayer, people are convicted of their unworthiness, of their lack of enthusiasm, they're, they're called to repent of their own personal condition and repent for the state of the nation. Now people say repentance and, and, and so on is, is essential for revival to happen. That's true. Historically, that is the pattern. But it isn't, you don't have to wait for everybody to get to that condition, strangely enough. What I've read is that a group gets there, the Lord blesses them, he begins to turn up, word gets around. And other people with, with slightly different um, motivations begin to join in and get blessed by the grace of God and the thing grows. And um, it, that's, that's it's a critical mass of people who mean business with God um, that leads God to, um, to move. 
the other, another thing is that when the, when the Lord comes in power and, and the churches are filled, the, 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 the format of the meetings are quite amazing. It's not like this, someone standing up here. In fact, it will be very unlikely when the Holy Spirit comes in power historically. don't know whether he's going to do something different, of course. But there wasn't any room for preaching because the people were moved by the Holy Spirit to sing together or to give a testimony, or to pray for them, for their family, or for the nation, or for the village around them, or whatever. It was, it was led by the Holy Spirit. It often used to start before the start time. It used to start because the building was packed to the gunnels, and people were listening through the windows, trying to get in through the doors. And what's the point of waiting to, for 7 o'clock when they're 5 o'clock? It's jam-packed with people. Um, and so it just was moving along by... The, the, the Holy Spirit quite a challenge for leaders I would say there's a case I read about where there were four eminent gentlemen of course s- sitting in the pulpit and this move of God was going on in the congregation and several times they got up to say something but someone would sing and everybody would burst along singing with it it wasn't to stop them preaching it was probably because they had their eyes shut and they thought glory to God um, and then somebody would burst in with a testimony. Um, I'll look at that in a minute. The prayer meetings were full. Yeah. God's presence every day and all day and night, including young people. Young people were included and very happy to be there. Um, and people like um, me had their strength renewed and felt young. Yes. Now, the conversions that took place in many of the revivals were what we would call powerful new births. There were cases or instances where people were under real conviction of sin for a long time. And those who sought to organize these things, let them get on with it. There's an expression that I invented, if they're going through it, leave them to it. If they're going through it, leave them to it, because God is working deep things in their hearts. It wasn't a nominal conversion. Most, if not all, were deep conversions, real conviction of sin, crying out to God for mercy and repenting and coming through it and rejoicing when they came through it. Their faces, although they're sweaty and running tears and things, such joy because they knew that their sins were dealt with by the Lord Jesus Christ. And another thing, obviously, the impact of these outpourings on a church was that the community was dramatically changed. I mean, I've just got here that the courts were empty. and There weren't any cases to try. People paid off their debts. I thought that was good. <laughs> Families were restored. Families were restored. I do love you after all. The fact that I've been drinking all the money and you never got any for housekeeping, I apologise. I'll work harder and I'll bring restored families. And the, the level of morality um, was, was increased towards um, what the Bible expects of us. People were faithful to their families and so on and didn't steal anymore. Reading. Listen to this. I keep it in my Bible because it's so good. Since the beginning of the Great Awakening, we have had congregations on weekdays, varying from 500 to 1,000. Whereas several months ago, it would have been very difficult to have collected 200 persons on any occasion. Formerly, I was under the necessity of giving up a monthly prayer meeting The attendance was so miserable that the only way in which I could maintain a semblance of it was by holding district meetings, thus infiltrating through the bounds of my church. And even then, very few came together. It's like stealing Vineyard's prayer meeting and adding another ten, you know, that's how it was. Finally, no sooner did the Holy Ghost breathe on the dead houses than eight weekly and two bi-weekly district meetings sprang up spontaneously. And in addition to these, we have weekday and the two Lord's Day meetings, prayer meetings, which are numerously attended. Formerly, I was obliged to abandon the second service on the Sabbath in summer and substitute a kind of double service without an intermission. 
Now the attendance at the evening lecture, evening meeting, is frequently as good as the morning, and notwithstanding the frequency of our meetings, none are saying, what a weariness it is. This is old language. No, some do not leave the church from morning till the close of the evening service. Isn't that good? Prayer meetings, eh? Sign of revival. And if you read the books, you, you, you know in Wales how the miners down below got converted in their tea breaks under the um, light of their, what they call Davy lamps, someone would stand up and give a testimony, I came to the Lord last Sunday, I've repented from my sins, I've got back with my family, and someone else nearby would fall to their knees and say, me too, me too. There's one case of the, the um, foreman down below who used to call Smith, Evans, well it wouldn't be Smith, Evans, Jones, do this, do that. He called out, Jim, could I have a word with you? Yes, sir. Jim goes to see the foreman and the foreman says, Jim, I want what you've got. Can you lead me to Christ now? Get rid of my sins. And so they would kneel down and Jim was leading his boss to the Lord. There's another account of um, this chairman of the Ethical Society, which was totally opposed to what God was doing. And he lived in a house not too far from the chapel in Wales. And he, he and four other buddies were um, meeting, opposing the, what God was doing. So this boss of the Ethical Society was sitting in his house, and uh, Evan Roberts happened to be in the chapel. And when the singing happened, rose so loud and so harmonious, and this chap happened to be a, a singer, but not of Christian songs, of the worldly songs, and he was so moved by what he was hearing in the singing that he, he, he was convicted by the Holy Spirit and repented of his sin, went to the chapel, the outskirts of it, because he couldn't get in, and gave his life to Christ. He then came back about 11 o'clock at night, because the meetings were going on, and he looked at his bookshelf of all these ethical books and he took them down from the shelf and put them on the kitchen table, opened up the fire and put them in one by one until they all consumed. And his wife said, what are you doing? What are you doing with your books? She said, I don't need them anymore. The only book I need is the Bible. And his kids who heard all the burning and the crackling all came down because kids like a bonfire, don't they? And they watched their father burning all these books. And you may remember, um, you've heard of Eric Liddell? Eric Liddell was that famous runner. He took a meeting in Edinburgh University and the, the place was packed with um, people come to hear him and his testimony. And in the front row, there was all these professors, you know, looking like this, and sort of, mm hmm And the Christian Fellowship, which consisted, I don't know, about 30 or 40 people, um, lined themselves up as counsellors in case somebody got converted. And where Eric Liddell and another chap gave their testimony, and the presence of the Lord was so powerful that hundreds ran to the front for salvation, and the poor Christian fellowship couldn't counsel them, but, you know, God did his work. But even some of these professors said, well, there's obviously something going on here, I'll have to think about it, won't we? Um, and then, finally, uh, the books say that there are times of refreshing, implying that um, there's a start and a finish. Um, and we, we won't go into that. Now, recent prophecies about um, the, the times of refreshing. Going back to 1795, is that recent enough? When Will, <laughs> William Wilberforce made a statement about this nation compared with the other nations of Europe. And he said, um, from his observations, let Europe do its own thing. Let Europe go in its secular way, away from God. But let this nation not trust in its navies and its armies, but let it trust in the gospel and the kingdom of God. Let it be different from anyone else who doesn't want to know. Let us stand out in Europe as a nation under God and let us pursue the ways of the Lord and let us trust not in humanity but in the Lord. And he said that so many years ago. And then in 1967, um, 
Jean Darnell gave this famous prophecy, um, this vision really, that she saw these little fires developing all over the country, which consisted, in, in her interpretation, of, of local life in the Lord springing up. And then these little fires were zapped by lightning from heaven, sparkling them up and making them more powerful and influencing their areas around to the point that the, the Lord poured out his spirit on the nation. And from that anointing, the, the gospel spread into Europe, interesting in the present climate. The other prophecies which I weren't seeking, I wasn't seeking prophecies, I was longing for revival to come, but these things have come to my attention from various sources that the Lord is shaking. I mean, it's clearly obvious, but these were given before it was happening. The Lord is shaking the nations. Um, and, and you just have to listen to the news, if you will, and see what the Lord is doing. But for this nation, he's shaking us. He's shaking us politically, economically, governmentally, and he's shaking the church. The examples given is the recent discovery of child abuse and so on. But it occurred to me as I began to think about shaking, is God showed me that an olive tree is harvested by its shaking. Did you know that? And the olives fall down and they're harvested. So it's not all bad news, but for a harvest to come, we obviously um, we need to be shaken. And so one person had a vision of the strong wind of the Spirit blowing on a series of beach huts. And some of these beach huts were for the glory of God. Most of them were just secular. And as the wind of God blew, they all collapsed. Except those ones which had been dedicated in some way were for the glory of God. Such a shaking and collapsing is forecast. Looking at Daniel and Nehemiah, um, being reminded that these men saw what God wanted to do, prayed about it, confessed the sins of the nation, identified themselves with the sins of the nation, and called out to God to be merciful. And in both cases, we know that he was. Then we've got um, the, the, what for me is a new way of proclaiming what the will of the Lord is as revealed in scripture and is initiated in my life by Suzanne Ferret and the way she um, sends out these emails with lots of ideas really of how to proclaim what the, God, what the Lord wants. National calls for prayer leading to a society change to the glory of God. One prophecy which I was quite impacted was that what we're going through at the moment is like Israel being released from Egypt. Now, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but the thing about Israel being released from Egypt is that the Egyptians were impacted by an awareness of the Lord. The Lord did it that way with the with the plagues and things, so that the Egyptians and the court of Pharaoh would know that he is the Lord. That matters to God, that unbelievers and those who oppose the Lord's will know that he is the Lord. Another aspect is that the way the, the Israelites themselves came out of Egypt, how they were delivered, that they may know that he is the Lord. Because the people of God need to be reminded that he's the Lord. He's not just an entertainer, he's the Lord. And also, when they came through the Red Sea into the desert and the way the Lord led them, the surrounding nations knew that he is the Lord and the way the Lord is dealing with the church at this time and possibly even this nation. Um, pressing on now. Personal revelations, if you've got time to listen. I believe God loves revivals. That's something I've picked up. He loves to do it. And Jesus is the same. He's come to seek and to save the lost. Um, a typical expression in revival accounts is that thousands are swept into the kingdom. I like that. Thousands are swept into the kingdom. And yet, each individual has a testimony of the grace of God, the conviction of God, and the forgiveness of God. Motivation to pray for revival or is always in the sense of how much do we love the lost? I don't know about you, now really ask yourselves, how much do we love the lost? 
Further, when I drive around the country and I see an empty church, or I hear of a church closing, or I hear it's only got 10 people in it, that grieves me. An empty church, it used to be filled. And very often, if you look at the blocks, that, the foundation stones, these were churches built with sacrificial giving, lives laid down, pension pots, if they had them in those days, given, so that the structure in which the people of God could meet, see them empty, see them sold off, see them converted to a house, that grieves me. I think it, the name of the Lord becomes irrelevant and is replaced by something else. And then finally, a motivation would be for the longing of the, for the manifestation of the glory of God. Because that happens in revival. If we really want to see it, then um, we need to pray accordingly. Reading accounts brings faith of similar manifestations. Um, and I want tonight in the prayer meeting to, to read uh, some accounts. Um, so finally, <clears throat> action. Do we really want it? Do we need, to, we need to count the cost of it actually happening for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our environment and the large numbers of people that will be added to our fellowship? It will take us a, a lifestyle change to actually welcome them and want them to be part of us. Um, and we have to imagine our changed lifestyles. If I get time, I want to read something. that We might get a knock on our door saying, we know you're Christians, we've got conviction of sin, can you help us? I know it's half past 11 at night, but we're desperate. Will you be willing to do it? A change of lifestyle. We've already talked about how when the Spirit comes, there's a lot more gatherings together, which some people call meetings, but I don't use that word because we don't like meetings, but gatherings together when the Lord turns up, and that's very much um, likely to happen. Um, I, I've started the Blue Light Brigade. The Blue Light Brigade are people who see blue lights flashing or hear, Nina, 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 and then motivated to pray for an aspect of revival. So I get lots of um, opportunities to pray for revival, especially when I went into hospital and it was happening all the time. <laughs> in terms of... <laughs> in practical preparation, we need to be equipped for discipling others. Would you be any good at it? What did Jesus do? He showed them how it works. He taught them from his understanding of the scriptures. A life of prayer, of Bible study, of glory seeking, of practical... Could, could you say to people, come and see how I do it without being ashamed? Or would you have to change your lifestyle before you feel comfortable letting people copy what you are as a Christian? Would you encourage them to be baptised? So, because you've been baptised and so on. And then finally, to take care of any personalities who God anoints to lead because they can get worn out and sometimes um, have to pack it in and go away. So spreading the loads into teams is... Um, have I got time just to read a few snippets? Yeah? Nearly time. Listen to these good news. The scene was almost indescribable. Tier upon tier of men and women filled every inch of space. Those who couldn't gain admittance stood outside listening at the doors. Others rushed to the windows there was almost e where almost every word was audible. When at seven o'clock the service began, quite 2,000 people must have been present. The enthusiasm was unbounded. Women sang and shouted till the perspiration ran down their faces and men jumped up one after another to testify. One told in quivering accents the story of a drunken life. A working collier spoke like a practiced orator and one can imagine what the note of the testimony of a converted gypsy woman struck when dressed in her best she told of her reformation and repentance. At 10 o'clock the meeting had lost none of its ardour, and that's three hours later. Prayer after prayer went up from those Welsh hearts with almost dreary persistence. Time and again the four ministers who stood on the pulpit attempted to start a hymn, but it was all in vain. The revival had taken hold of the people, and even Evan Roberts couldn't hold it in check. He was the leader. His latest convert is a policeman who after complaining that people had gone mad after religion, so that there was nothing for him to do, went to see for himself. 
and bursting into tears, confessed the error of his ways and repented. Jared Cooper wrote this book, which I won't describe why he wrote it, but it's powerful. I encountered the glory of God in a six-week visit to South Africa. During the time, I was filled with the vision of the United Kingdom and Europe. When I read that, yes. Night after night, I awoke. Day after day, I prayed. And visions of a great revival were burning into my heart. I am convinced the church must be ready to host a glory at a level previously unknown. The presence of God is preparing to sweep across Europe as never seen before. It will be in response to the apostolic reformation currently underway. Stadiums, arenas and great auditorium will be turned into church buildings. Marketplaces filled with thousands will be overcome by the glory of God. The blind will see, the lame will walk, street evangelism will happen as never before as mass healings take place on street corners and in shopping centres. There may... Where many have spent years sowing, others will reap on a massive scale. God's glory will touch the media, politics and royalty. His glory will invade live TV shows as men and women of God reveal the power of God in healing, strange signs and prophetic words and wisdom. Many politicians will come to Christ in a very visible way. For some this will bring prominence, for others ridicule and scandal. Governments and kings will call days of prayer. Thousands will stream into the kingdom of God as a great move of signs and wonders floods our churches and workplaces. And so it goes on and on. So that's his vision for the United Kingdom. Finally. If you'd like to turn with me in your Bibles to Habakkuk. I bet you can't find it before I have. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2. This summarizes everything that I've experienced and want to experience about revival. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2 Lord I have heard of your fame I stand in awe of your deeds O Lord renew them in our day in our time make them known in wrath remember mercy shall we read that out together Lord I have heard of your fame I stand in awe of your deeds O Lord renew them in our day in our time make them known in wrath Remember mercy. 